السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Welcome everybody This is the Bilal Abdul Kareem show and I am Bilal Abdul Kareem and this week we're going to be talking about some stuff y'all we're going to get in trouble but that's all right because you know we need to talk about the things that are important so that uh, you know so people can benefit we're going to be talking about three things we are going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about ISIS is, is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to be talking about Dara, which is ongoing, and we're going to be giving you some updates in terms of what that's all about. And in addition to that, we're going to be talking about, of all places, uh, the kids trapped in the mines in, uh, in Thailand. No, 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 we're not going to talk about that because you don't need me to talk about that because that's being talked about in the news, and uh, you can get that from anywhere. But we're going to be talking about where else? Denmark. I said, Denmark? What the heck is going on out there? Well, you got you to gotta hang on. You got to find out. All right. But first up, we're going to be talking about ISIS is what we're going to be talking about here today. Now, uh, everybody here knows what's been happening in Dara. Dara is a place where it was supposed to be a de-escalation zone, um, and it like kind of didn't really pan out to be that way. Uh, the uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad and his cronies, um, that includes Putin and the Iranians and so on and so forth, um, decided that, well, we haven't respected any of the other de-escalation deals, so why should this one be any different? So they just decided to say, hey, you know what we've done so far is that we've made this agreement, frozen all the battlefronts, and we've been able to pick them off one by one. And you know what? The international community has said nothing. How cool is that? So let's go after Dara. And they said, uh, sure, why not? Let's do it. And that's exactly what they did. Um, scores, I'm talking about hundreds of innocent people killed, thousands. I'm talking about uh, uh, something to the tune of 150, 160 thousand refugees stuck at the border because the Jordanian authorities won't let them in and uh, they have no place to go. So we're talking about um, hundreds of thousands displaced and we're also talking about um, hundreds which were killed. And all of this is happening when there is supposed to be a de-escalation agreement in place. And the place is getting carpet bombed. And you don't really hear much. Last week you had a little something from Damon Sturis that it was a bad idea or something or other. And you had some other rumblings or ramblings uh, from the U.S. government talking about bad acid, bad acid, bad Russia, bad Russia. You know, and basically, you know, just going on to the next topic. And, um, and that's all pretty much that you've got. And that's all that they knew was going to happen. And that's why they carried out these attacks. But what does all this have to do with ISIS? Well, ISIS has got a little uh, enclave out there um, uh, called, uh, in a place called Suedat, or affectionately referred to as Sueda. And um, they're a group called uh, Khatib to Khalim al Walid, um, but they are really um, ISIS and they are ISIS controlled and they act like ISIS, taste like ISIS, smell like ISIS, and do everything that ISIS does. Um, and, they, uh, and, and they are connected to them, um, even though they don't carry the ISIS name. Um, but uh, that part is clear. Now, interesting thing of note rebels. Uh, or there has been a lot of talk about rebels opening up battlefronts to take the heat off of um, what's happening in Dara. Well, it looks like, um, we're going to come back to that in a second, but it also looks like Daula, or ISIS, had an idea to do that too. What they said to the other groups now, see, ISIS is besieged there. But who is besieging them? The, uh, the rebel forces or opposition forces are besieging them because they're like wild animals. They attack anybody that's not a part of them. So they are besieged. So ISIS, feeling marginalized, said, hey, we got an idea. Let's send a message over to the opposition forces um, that are fighting uh, Bashar al-Assad. And uh, we'll say to them, look, we will stop fighting you. You won't fight us. Just open up the border so that we can go and we can attack Esed. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, they haven't been attacking Esed anywhere, basically, but they've been attacking opposition forces and um, Islamic forces um, all around the country, wherever they get the opportunity to do that. So, of course, nobody really trusts them. And then they said, ah, you know what? That first message really just ah, 
just didn't work out. But I got another idea. Let's tell them, okay, if you won't open up your borders so that we can go to fight the regime, why don't you send your women and children here? Because we're not getting bombed. You find yourself sitting there saying, yeah, that's right. They aren't getting bombed. That's, that's interesting that they're not getting bombed. But see, what's even more interesting is their stupid offer that they think that anybody would trust them to send their women and their children out there to ISIS country. Uh, you know, you can't make this stuff up. You know, this, you know, I, I, I you know, I used to be a creative writer and um, but I couldn't make up stuff like that. Um, but that's the way that it happened. You see. So I'm, I'm just um, bringing you the news here. At any rate. Now, there's been a lot of talk about rebel forces and particularly in the northern part of the country, opening up the battlefronts um, all around um, um, northern Syria so as to take the heat off of the uh, rebel forces in Dara because right now they're being bombarded. And, you know, the Russians are having um, um, a field day. Um, everybody is basically joined in that. But the other battlefronts are pretty much cooled. So there's no need to focus any um, resources to those battlefronts. Now, I don't know if they're going to um, mount an attack or launch an attack or anything like that. But there's been a lot of talk about them possibly doing that. And uh, some say that there's going to be uh, something happening um, within the next day or two. And some say totally forget about it. The, uh, uh, the opposition forces are too fractured and they're not going to be able to um, mount anything or do anything. But lo and behold, guess who shows up? ISIS, feeling marginalized, feeling ignored, feeling like they're not a part of anything. They just they put out a message just yesterday and they said, فنقول إلى جنود الهيئة فإنكم جميعكم أهدار وإلى جنود التركستان والأوزبك وكل من يحذو حذوهم وكل فصائل الردة والغدر وكل جنود الردة وكل من قاتل مع أولئك المرتدين فإنكم أهداف قادمة بإذن الله بإذن الواحد القهار وإلى جد الأقصى الغدارين المرتدين فأبشروا بما يسوءكم فأنتم الأهداف الجديدة الآن فنفاقكم وردتكم لا مثيل له في أرض الشام وما رأينا من مثل غدركم يا أعداء الله فأبشروا بما يسوءكم والحرب بيننا وبينكم سجال فهذه رسالتنا من ولاية إدلب فأبشروا أبشروا أبشروا بالذبح والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الواحد First of all, they had to do their, their normal roll call, which is basically to let everybody know who is no longer a Muslim. And on that list were uh, Hayat Tahrir Sham, um, uh, 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 the Turkestanis, the Uzbekis, and newly added to the, to the list are Jundal Aqsa. Now, basically what they said is that they are um, sending this message from the state of Idlib. This is supposed to be the new uh, ISIS state. Cough, cough. Uh, they don't like control like any neighborhoods or anything like that, or any streets or anything like that. They might have an ISIS ice cream shop somewhere, somewhere. I'm not sure. But the point of the matter is, is that they don't control anything. And they're saying that this is uh, broadcasting from the uh, 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 caliphate or something like that um, in Idlib. Okay, nice titles. But the reality of the situation is that they only have the ability to play the role of the spoiler now. They don't have enough forces to be able to actually take territory, but what they can do are car bomb attacks and assassinations and things of this nature. But the interesting thing is the timing. The timing. Just as there's a lot of talk um, that they want rebel forces to mount an attack against the regime, lo and behold, ISIS sends out a message and they say that all of those groups that were just mentioned, the Haid Tahrir Sham, Jund al-Aqsa, Turkestanis, Uzbekis, Uzbekis, and all of those that work with them, as according to the statement, um, that you're all targets. Now, this is typical ISIS behavior. This is what they do. What they'll do is they wait until 
uh, there's um, the backs of the opposition forces are turned to face off against Bashar al-Assad and the Russians and the enemies of the Syrian people. And then they come from the back and they launch their attacks. There was a large scale attack that took place in Hama some months ago. I'd say approximately, I don't know, six months ago, something like that. Is that right? Maybe about six months ago. And uh, as the battle heated up, guess who showed up? It was ISIS. But they didn't show up to fight Bashar al-Assad. Actually, there were some places in northern Hema when uh, the uh, opposition forces were fighting the uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad forces and the Russians. All of a sudden, they were being attacked from behind. They were attacked by, from behind. That was one tactic, tactic that they used. Another tactic that they used were to set up checkpoints along the route from like the city centers to the areas where it, to, to the front lines. So there may be one, two, three kilometers or whatever. All of a sudden, there would be these checkpoints that would be set up by people that look like um, um, Islamic forces because they do. They have beards. They have, you know, all of the raiment um, that Islamic forces uh, in this part of the world uh, wear and look like. And they also um, have this same kind of talk and so on and so forth. Uh, so when unsuspecting rebel forces would be on their way to the battlefronts, all of a sudden they would notice that they come to the checkpoint and they would be fired upon. And they killed lots of rebel forces like that. But notice they didn't do that until the battle heated up with uh, Bashar al-Assad and uh, uh, against uh, his forces. Now, am I sitting here telling you that they are working alongside with Bashar al-Assad? Uh, probably. I would probably say that they are because they've been known to mysteriously go from one area which was besieged by Bashar al-Assad forces and miraculously show up seven kilometers later with uh, heavy, heavy weapons and tanks and, and things of this nature. Uh, how did they go through those areas, walk right by regime forces, and then they end up in um, uh, these liberated territories. How did they do that? I'm not sure. How did they do that? You know, we've got some, uh, I'm sure that we've got some ISIS supporters that are out there that like to watch this stuff and send me messages like we are making dua that you get cancer and stuff like that, Bilal. But um, um, I'd be curious to ask you this question. Now, let's talk real business. How would, are they able to do things like that? It's very interesting. Now, probably all of them are probably not in on the deal. You've probably got just the, uh, the, their leadership. They fire a few rounds in the area and say, everybody run. And then they run. Next thing you know, they say, oh, we're in another territory. Well, how do we do that? And somebody will sit there and say, oh, well, you know, it's because we've been making dua. And they think that, you know, that's how it's been happening. Well, that's not how it's been happening, everybody. So, that's the situation. Um, uh, there were reports that uh, uh, ISIS uh, leader Abu Bakr Baghdadi, um, his son was killed in uh, rural Homs uh, just uh, two or three days ago. These are reports. There's no way to verify that. Not sure. But um, these are the reports that are there. Uh, the whereabouts of Abu Bakr Baghdadi are uh, still uh, currently uh, unknown. Uh, actually, Unless I've missed my guess, and I don't think that I have, Abu Bakr Baghdadi was spotted basically one time when he gave his speech in, um, at the uh, masjid in uh, Mosul, uh, declaring the quote-unquote caliphate. And um, we didn't see any other video uh, statements from him. There have been some audio stuff, and he's been reported killed about six times and everything. Um, so I don't know. Um, by most, no, not most, Basically, all accounts, ISIS is not centrally run. So uh, it's kind of an every man for themselves thing. But this is the situation. I don't know if there's going to be a large scale attack against regime forces. But um, um, who knows? Uh, the regime probably thinks that because it seems like they may have even activated uh, uh, their ISIS uh, counterparts. And uh, that's why they've uh, come out with this uh, new message that was just released just yesterday. All right, we're going to take a break and stay with us, and we will come back because we've got more. This is the Bilal Abdul Kareem Show. I'm Bilal Abdul Kareem. Jazakum Allahu Khaira.
All right. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam, rasulullah. We're going to change the channel a little bit, and we're going to now go to Europe, to Denmark. Now, I've been to, uh, uh, to Denmark. I met some really nice people uh, uh, out there, um, both uh, Muslim and non-Muslim. But, you know, we kind of have this idea that we live in this really, really advanced society that, uh, uh, you know, these so-called European values and things of this nature uh, – are dominating society, or at least they like to think that. But I kind of beg to differ on a lot of different fronts, but we don't have time to talk about all of that right now. But I would like to discuss what's taking place in Denmark. Now, I'm going to say some stuff to you, and you're not going to believe me, because it's shocking. But here we go. The authorities in Denmark are feeling like they've got an immigration problem and that there are too many uh, quote unquote ghettos, okay? Too many ghettos. Now, first of all, let's define what, let's use their definition of a ghetto. Now, a ghetto is as follows. It has to satisfy two of the following three requirements. A ghetto has to fire, has to satisfy two of the following three requirements to get the designation of, uh, uh, as a ghetto. And it is as follows. One, half of the immigrants are, uh, uh, are from non-Western countries. Got that? Half of the immigrants are from non-Western countries. Two, 40% of those in the area are unemployed. Three, 2.7% have criminal convictions. Stop, go back, and think about where you live right now. Half of the immigrants are from non-Western countries. So, um, if you've got um, poor immigrants from Mexico, that would not be, be one of the requirements. If you've got poor immigrants that are coming from, uh, um, uh, from uh, Haiti, Haiti, that's a, that's a Western country. They don't have all of the raiments that most Western countries have, but they are still a Western country. And that would not be one of the uh, requirements that would have been satisfied. Uh, people coming from uh, Egypt, Pakistan, Somalia, other Muslim countries, these people would be considered under that, uh, 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 that, that particular condition. 40% uh, unemployed. Well, most ghettos have a high unemployment rate. <laughs> Minor detail, right? Because that's why it's a ghetto. Uh, or 2.7% have con uh, criminal con convictions. Now, just one second here. <coughs> now, now that you've got that, they passed a law on the 28th of May, basically, which is part of a larger plan to, quote, eradicate parallel con uh, uh, communities, to eradicate parallel communities. Now, listen to what some of this law, which was passed, and then I'm going to tell you what they're planning to pass, that children, once they turn one years old, I didn't say 11, I didn't say 21, I didn't say 31, I said one years old, they will be required, required to enter to daycare centers for at least 25 hours a week. I did not mince words. They will be required to uh, enter daycare centers for at least 25 hours a week where they're going to be taught Danish culture and language, including Christian holidays like Christmas and Easter. Now check out what's going to happen if you refuse. If parents are on the uh, social system, their uh, wel uh, welfare benefits, they stand the possibility of losing them because they refuse to send their children one years old for 25 hours a week to be taught about Danish culture and language, including Christian holidays and like Christmas and Easter and their other holidays. Did you get that? Let me ask you all a question. Would you be comfortable if for whatever reason, whichever country you're in, you are forced out of that country? 
and uh, or, or you just migrated or whatever it is, you left that country, even just because th there was a, a better job um, in the United Arab Emirates or in uh, Qatar or something like that, where there are a lot of Westerners. If they all of a sudden came down with a rule that said it is now obligatory to send us your children for 25 hours a week so that they can be taught um, Islamic culture and Islamic customs and Islamic holidays and so on and so forth so that they will have Islamic values or the values which are dominant or predominant in the UAE or in uh, Qatar or in Kuwait or wherever it actually is. Let me ask you a question. Are you cool with that? Is that okay for you that they're taking your one-year-old, two, five years old, and if you don't do it, you ain't getting no welfare benefits? I mean, how is that? for, uh, you know, forcing things on people. And this is supposed to be the bastion of, uh, of tolerant society, values, values that everybody should be um, adhering to. Did y'all catch that? You got that, right? They said, now listen, and, and just so that you don't think, listen to the statement here. Quote, the ghettos must disappear. We will take control of who moves, in particularly burdened areas. We will punish criminality extra hard. Meaning, those people in those ghetto areas that are caught doing vandalism, criminality, stealing, and things of this nature, the punishment is going to be worse in those areas than there would be the rest of uh, Danish society. Now you're going to be sitting there saying, ah, come on, Bilal, you got to be out your mind. Who would say such a thing? Well, who, who was it? Was it the janitor? Was it the tea man? Was it the, you know, the guy that wants to run for office, he just has to talk tough? No. It was the prime minister, Lars Rasmussen. And this is when he was talking to other ministers. Did you catch that? It's all out there in the open. This, this is nothing hidden here. I want you guys to, 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 to get this, right? Now, uh, uh, check this out. This was said by the Minister of Immigration, who said that, who, you know, basically they, they, was, uh, they were saying that uh, Muslims are a danger to work in Danish society when they are fasting. He said this last May, just before Ramadan. That there are dangers to, to a society when they are fasting and that they should just stay home to, quote, to avoid negative consequences for the rest of Danish society. Now, <laughs> they banned the, the, uh, uh, the veil uh, last month, it was. They, they, they banned the veil. Now, when you listen to stuff like this, come on, y'all. We got to be sitting here saying, what in the world is going on? Now, this is something that is like out there in the open. Let me ask you a question here. If people of this nature had troops in a Muslim country, do you think that those troops would deal justly with the Muslim population? Do you believe that? Do you think that they would treat them in a proper fashion. Does anybody out there believe that? When they have lawmakers that are making these statements out there in front of everybody, and one of the most primary directives of these lawmakers is to make sure that there's enough votes in the kitty so that they can be reelected. So that means they're not just talking to themselves, they're talking to the wider Danish uh, society. That means that the rest of the people in the Danish society, they're cool with that also. Not all of them, but a good portion of them that they feel like they can come out like that and just say um, uh, and, and make these statements. Would anybody out there be OK with a setup like this? That the fact that if 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 uh, your son or brother or uncle or whatever it was stole something from somewhere. And let's say that whatever it was that he stole, he would he would get three years in prison. But because he stole it in a certain area. He's going to get six years in prison. Does that like and then people and if something were to happen and we hope that something would not happen where innocent people who are not a part of this 
um, would be affected. But if somebody were to pull off some type of terrorist attack, then what would happen? They come and say, look at, look at all these terrorists. See, we were right all along. Just look at the pressure that you're putting on the people. Look at the society of intolerance that you are creating. And this is supposed to be the European value system that you are inviting uh, uh, these, uh, the, the, the immigrant population to? Well, I'm glad I'm not there because if you were selling it to me, I ain't buying. But, you know, I don't live there and I realize that the situation is difficult for some people just to pack up and just to move. But this is what we have. Um, look, everybody. This is where we are for this week. We're going to have to uh, leave it there. Um, we would like for everybody to please share this. Um, Alhamdulillah, um, we're really happy um, with uh, the response that we've been getting for, um, for these shows. It's a bit controversial sometimes, but hey, that's, th that's what we do because we love you. And we, want to, we have to bring the things to you that need to be discussed and not just talk about just flowers and roses. All right, everybody? So please do share. My name is Bilal Abdul Karim, and this has been the Bilal Abdul Karim Show. Jazakum Allahu khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.